Attention, all troops. He's alive. Alive. Welcome to the Raffinola. I have a list of shows that I want to do. It often takes longer to get those shows recorded because I have to think back to how I can relate to those shows. Now, I've wanted to do a Man From Atlanta show for a bit, and I remembered watching it as a kid, but even though I enjoyed it, it never really stuck in my head some thread that would allow me to put it into the show. Now, just last week, I had the honor of talking to Mr. Patrick Duffy about The Man from Atlantis. So sort of the pressure was on, and I was trying to come up with something, anything. And actually, the idea of what to talk about hit right after I got off the phone with Mr. Duffy. I had to call my sister, and we were talking for a little bit about some stuff. And I mentioned to her that I had just talked to Patrick Duffy, and she was very excited. She said, oh, she was, he was great in Dallas. And I said, yeah, we talked about The Man from Atlantis. And she said, oh my gosh, The Man from Atlantis. I love that show. We used to watch that. And it occurred to me, my sister was a couple of years older than me. We didn't have a lot of crossover on TV shows. But when we did, it was pretty awesome. And although this is not specific to The Man from Atlantis, I just want to talk about how wonderful sometimes TV can be because you never really can tell what is going to be popular amongst one age group or one demographic even in a household. And when there is something that you can come together on, you have something to talk about all of a sudden. And that's exactly what happened between my sister and I. We suddenly had these shared memories that we were able to talk about and relate to one another, which spread to all bunch of other things, how we would watch the show. As a kid, there was nothing better than when my family watched TV together. My sister's on the floor, me on the couch between my mother and father. Bowls of ice cream that never seem to run out before the end of an hour show, although I'm not sure how that's possible. It was warm and comfortable, and those TV memories are ones that I savor, and I'm glad that the man from Atlantis allowed me to have a discussion with my sister about something and trigger some of those memories. On today's show, we're going to talk about The Man from Atlantis. We'll talk about the cast of the show. We'll talk about its reception here and abroad. We'll talk about the production of the show. We'll talk about the show's presence outside of television. We'll talk about the DVD release. And we have a very special guest. As I mentioned, I had the honor of talking to Patrick Duffy, star of The Man from Atlantis, amongst other things. And not only is this perfect for the Man from Atlantis show, it is also my first personal interview for the show. So I hope you enjoy it. I know I did. We have an info-packed episode ahead of us. So without further ado, let's start the show. Man from Atlantis stars Patrick Duffy as a man with no memories. He has amnesia, but he's given the name Mark Harris. He is believed to be the only surviving citizen of the lost civilization of Atlantis, which becomes obvious because he has some attributes. He has an exceptional ability to swim. He can breathe underwater and go really deep. He also has superhuman strength. Why is he so good at swimming? His hands and feet are webbed. And the effects on the hands and feet, if you've seen them when you were a kid, really stick with you. Because they were really well done. Webbed hands. I always wanted that when I was swimming in a pool. So when Mark does swim with these webbed hands and feet, he swims sort of in the fashion of a fish. Or maybe more like a dolphin. 
He also has these bizarre eyes that are unusually sensitive to light. After he is discovered, he is recruited by a group called the Foundation for Oceanic Research, which is an agency that conducts top-secret research plumbing the ocean depths in their submarine, the Cetacean. The show had a wonderful cast in addition to Patrick Duffy. You had Jay Montgomery as Dr. Elizabeth Merrill, Alan Fudge as C.W. Crawford Jr., Victor Buono as the villain, Mr. Schubert, Kenneth Tiger as Dr. Miller Simon, and Jean Marie Hahn as Jane. Let's talk a little bit about this cast before we get into the production side of things. You had Patrick Duffy as Mark Harris. Patrick George Duffy was born March 17, 1949. Probably best known for his work on Dallas, where he played Bobby Ewing from 1978 to 1985, then took a year off and then returned from 1986 to 1991. Almost immediately afterwards, he would land a role on the sitcom Step by Step with Suzanne Somers, which ran from 1991 to 1998. You can find a lot more information about Patrick Duffy at patrickduffy.org. And of course, if you stay tuned, we have an interview with Patrick Duffy later. Belinda Montgomery played Dr. Elizabeth Merrill. Montgomery was born in Winnipeg, Canada, and she's probably best known as the matriarch in the Doogie Howser TV show, Catherine Howser. Before that, she would have a recurring role as Carolyn Crockett on Miami Vice, and she's worked in a ton of stuff. She seems to have retired from acting somewhat and is a watercolor painter of some regard. But in 2010, she played Grandma Flynn in Tron Legacy, a great movie. Alan Fudge played C.W. Crawford. Alan Fudge was born in February of 44. If you watch TV in the 70s and 80s, Fudge was in a ton of television shows. Kojak, Cagney and Lacey, Wonder Woman, The Wonder Years, Dynasty, Dallas, MacGyver, you name it, he's been in it. He also appeared in some movies like Airport 75, The Natural, and Edward Scissorhands. The great Victor Buono played Dr. Schubert. Buono passed away in 1982. Like Fudge, he worked in a ton of television shows and movies, probably best known for his work on the Wild Wild West and for playing King Tut in the 1960s version of Batman. He also has a very memorable part in one of those short segments of Night Gallery called Satisfaction Guaranteed. Jean Marie Hahn played Jane. She was born in 1955 in San Francisco, California, probably best known for her work here in The Man from Atlantis and as Ruth in Arc 2, so some good science fiction cred. She worked until about 1985, and I saw some clips of her playing on Hawaii Five-0 where she did a bit of a dramatic turn that looked really good. But after 85, nothing, and I haven't been able to find much online about her. Kenneth Tiger played Dr. Miller Simon, was born in 1942 in Massachusetts. If you watch any TV over the last 30 years, 40 years even, you probably would recognize Tiger Most recently, he's worked in Nurse Jackie, but he's been on Star Trek Voyager, Mr. Belvedere, a ton of stuff. What I didn't know about him is that he has a BA and a PhD from Harvard in German literature, and his translations of German plays to English have actually been performed. Today's show is brought to you by boats. Sure, you can see The Man from Atlantis when you're not on a boat, but why not see it on a boat? Get a boat and go, go, go. Have more fun. 
one on the H2O. Get with it, get a boat. 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 Get with it, Love those get boats. A boat. So a little bit about the production of The Man from Atlantis. There were four television movies in 1977 that went over pretty well, and there was a lot of interest in science fiction in the late 70s because of a little movie called Star Wars, and because these did pretty well, they decided to commission The Man from Atlantis as a full-run TV show. It would be produced by Herbert Franklin Solo, who'd done a ton of stuff up to that point. He oversaw the development and production of Medical Center and the courtship of Eddie's father. When he joined Desilu Studios, he was appointed VP of production in 64, and he oversaw the sale, development, and production of Star Trek, so no lightweight here. The show would premiere on September 22nd, 1977, and would run till June 6th, 1978. And it was rough on Patrick Duffy, and we talk a little bit about that in his interview, but some of the details of things he had to do are pretty insane. Because when he would talk underwater, air bubbles would escape, which would ruin the effect. They would have him inhale water into his nose and mouth while underwater to prevent the bubbles from escaping. And more than once I read that he got infections from doing so. He also had those weird eyes that I talk about to get that luminescent eye effect when he wasn't wearing his sunglasses. So he had to wear these custom molded contact lenses. They were hard to give that effect. Pretty dramatic when you see him in the TV show, but that must have been so painful to have to put those in episode after episode and all the other crazy stuff he had to do. There's a interesting compliment from Victor Buono, who complimented Duffy by saying that he was impressed because it was trying to act with golf balls stuck in your head. Crazy. Also, something that Patrick Duffy had to endure was constant shaving because Mark Harris didn't have body hair, so he had to constantly be shaving. It's weird what you can find out about things online, but somebody actually documented his switch from using a razor to an electric razor at some point during the show's run. I guess you could say Patrick Duffy was a pioneer in the hair removal field. Speaking of Patrick Duffy, I'm very happy to present my first interview for the Retro's podcast, Patrick Duffy. A lot of people who I'd be presenting this to are curious about The Man from Atlantis. And it was one of your first roles. I know you had done some other small things. How long have you been in Hollywood when you landed that role? I came to Hollywood in um, 74. In 74. In, in early 74. Is that right? 74? Or late 73, actually. Mm-hmm. And uh, Atlantis was 76. So I spent, uh, you know, three and a half years... Um, Two and a half years driving a truck, being a carpenter, you know, going to auditions and and basically subsistence living, and went from nothing. I, I like you say, I did a couple of little things. I did a, a PBS thing with Julie Harris, which was a, a real nice thing for me, and a and a two line part on an episode of Switch and a Taco Bell commercial. And then I was a carpenter and driving a truck and going to callbacks and, and interviews for The Man from the Planet at MGM Studios. And that lasted quite a while, of making the first cut, and then the second cut, and then finally meeting producers, and then going into... And then a screen test, a, a, a real cheesy screen test with five other actors. And then we did a real production... Uh, thing when the producers wanted me but the network wasn't too sure and then finally I got the stamp of approval from NBC the head of NBC's television department a, a lady whose name escapes me right now and I became the man from Atlantis but it was a long arduous uh, test uh, on a reoccurring basis of passing one bar and then another I mean I, I, re- I remember watching it at the time and seeing interviews with you talking to people it seemed kind of physically demanding. Well, it, uh, for a 28-year-old, it wasn't so bad. Um, you could put a gun to my head now, and I wouldn't do that show. But when you're 28 and you're in fairly good shape, uh, you do those things. Uh, but it was still difficult. And difficult, not, you know, I, it wasn't life-threatening, perhaps, but it was probably the most uncomfortable 
that I have ever volunteered to be on a regular basis. Um, the, you know, the format is he's an underwater man. So I literally was wet, you know, 50, 60, 70% of the time on that show, no matter what the weather was, no matter what the temperature was. Um, hose down Patrick and put him on camera. It was, it was pretty much the, the system. And that gets old after a while. Walking out into, you know, the Santa Monica Bay in November uh, in a little yellow swimming suit and disappearing underwater is not a fun thing to do. And running across pavement and, and out in the woods barefoot every time is not fun to do. So, uh, you know, 13 episodes in four movies, that's a full career for me on that show. Wow. I was glad to become a millionaire oil man. So it was sort of a relief, I mean, after you'd gotten on Dallas to yeah. have it over with? Yeah. It was. Um, it was frightening. I would have done the show year after year after year because it's, you know, work and it, you're the you're the lead in your own major television series. It's an incredible benefit to have that. Um and I was worried when it was canceled officially, when the word finally came out that uh, you know they're officially dropping the show. So don't hold on to any hopes. They're, you know, that's when every actor says, "Oh my God, what am I going to do next?" You know, what's what's I had a series and now I got nothing. Um, and then uh, Dallas. So and that was only seven days later. Wow. Yeah. And so and then you went right into kind of step by step after that. Um, yeah, and I wasn't that worried because um, when the handwriting was on the wall, uh, we knew that Dallas wasn't going to go, but they still hadn't officially canceled it. I was already in negotiations with uh, Miller Boyette for Step by Step, so I knew I was going to have a job almost immediately. And quite literally, I signed my Step by Step contract two weeks after Dallas was officially canceled. Wow. So, so I knew, but the first one, when, when a uh, Atlantis was canceled, and I really didn't know what the future was. It was, uh, you know, a, um, a growing moment, as my wife and I tell each other. You know, a lot of shows, smaller shows, even that didn't get a lot of hours on TV, would go into syndication, especially you know, sci-fi shows. Had you right. kept track of what had been going on with Man from Atlantis for all this time? Man from Atlantis pretty much did nothing. Uh, after it had been on the air. It didn't syndicate, as far as I know. It, it was popular in Europe and in other places around the world, but I was fully prepared for it to just disappear. I had a couple of VHS copies of a, of a couple of, uh, of the pilot and a couple episodes, and that was it. And it wasn't until Warner Archive uh, released the pilot on their archive, uh, and, and it got such a big response that George over there decided to remaster not only the, the pilot, which he went back and did. They first just released the pilot based on the old uh, master. They remastered the pilot. He went back and remastered the other three TV movies and the 13 episodes all in HD. And that's what this big release is all about. But it was because everybody has a, a memory of that show. Yeah, They remember... The webcams, or they remember this underwater guy, or the way he swam, or something. You know, they were probably anywhere from five to ten years old, but it's locked in their memory. And when they released the pilot, they got a huge response at Warner Archive. So that that gave birth to this whole resurrection of the entire series. And to me, you know, as much as I love me, uh, I'm such an old film buff. I'm a TCM freak. The fact that now television has the same opportunity to go back and resurrect these forgotten things that were wonderful, that wouldn't have the light of day ever again, but they can do it because it's an on-demand thing. They're really not expending that much money, and you want to see it, you order it, they print it up, and they'll send it to you. It's brilliant marketing, but it's also, to me more importantly, it's a brilliant way to maintain the history of our business. I had read that it was one of the first shows broadcast in China. Yes, yes. We were the first American television show to be purchased by the Republic of China for airing. And I always made the joke that the man from Atlantis only said about five words per episode, so it was easily done. 
So that's why they did it. I have no idea. I think it's that intriguing uh, attraction of science fiction. Uh, and, and you know, I think it's universal. Young people, really young people, not teenagers, but young people see this, and it's so foreign and yet so safe and attractive at the same time that um, it's a it's a simple sell to put that on the air and, and know that it's going to get an audience. Have you been to China at any time? No, but now that we're releasing the entire series, perhaps I'll get an invitation. Because I'd like to know if the, how they uh, how they remember you is uh, from this show or from Dallas. Well, I don't even know if Dallas ever aired in China, so it, it might be just this. Hmm. I like that. So one of my earliest memories of you, besides from Man from Atlantis, was in Battle of the Network Stars in 1977. Okay. Where you okay. where you handily beat uh, Lyle Wagoner in the obstacle course, and, right? <laughs> and, and and stole my sister's heart. Oh, did I? Oh, good. <laughs> so I was. This is something I've always wanted to ask someone who's been on Battle of the Network Stars. Why did you do Battle of the Network Stars? You know, I, I was positioned in in my career. Uh, to do something that had, you know, that was, I think, the first or second year it had ever been done. It was a new concept. Mm -hmm. um, and it was before it became uh, cutthroat. Now competition things, you know, and reality television has, has ruined the innocence of those types of shows. But when we did it, you know, it was been, each network had its team and we did things. But... We all had the best time together. There was never a, a breath of animosity. Uh, you know, as soon as the camera was off, we were hugging and laughing and, and drinking beer and, you know, just having the best possible time and getting paid a little bonus salary for doing it. It was, it was so much fun. That's why we did it. And it didn't really matter who won because all you were able to, everybody got paid the same. There was no bonus. And as all you got to do was jump up and down and say, yay, we beat you. So, it, it, it was just pure joy to do those. And I did it several years. I, I maybe did three of them over the years. Mm -hmm. And I formed relationships with people that I might not have ever met because we were on different networks. Your work schedule is heavy. Uh, you, you don't see those people because you go to your own network affiliate meetings and all those other things. So meeting Lyle and, and uh, Melissa Gilbert from Little House and all of these other people, it was a great party for a weekend and usually up at Pepperdine College in Southern California. Nobody got hurt. Um, the only thing that I, uh, I knew I was going to dread is the swimming competition because everyone expected me to win, mm -hmm. and I didn't. So. How does the man from Atlantis lose? Uh, because there was no special effects yeah. towing him through the water. So I was looking online, I don't know, about a year and a half ago, and... I, and I know this has nothing to do with the man from Atlantis, but I stumbled across your videos for Patrick Duffy and the Crab. Oh, yes. And I have tried to get people to watch these as often as possible because they're just great. Thank you. I love the fact that you like them. Um, that was produced, written, and directed by my son and his wife. Uh, and my son is an actor, director, uh, uh, writer, and his wife is a, prof you know, a professional writer, producer. She's now on um, free agents. She used to be on community. And they had this idea, and they pitched it to me. And I trust them. And I, as I trust my other son, he said, no, Dad, this is going to be cool. People are going to love this. And they wrote those episodes. I couldn't do them with a straight face for hours until we rehearsed it enough that it made sense. Um, and we're doing more. We're, uh, we're going to do a second season of them for the, for the web stuff. Uh, so more will be on the way, and thank you for liking them. Oh, that's great. I, I really, I don't know, there's something about how serious you took it. It wasn't jokey on the, on the front nope. end of things. And uh, it just, it, it, there's, there's honest chemistry going on. The thing is, the, the crab himself... Uh, is played by a man who has been one of my best friends for 30 years. David Leisure is an actor. He was on Empty Nest 
He was the crazy next door neighbor on Empty Nest. He was Joey Zuzu on the commercials for Subaru. Mm-hmm. Uh, or for He's Zuzu. And, um, he's been my friend. And so we get together and we laugh and we watch old movies. And when Connor asked me to do this and he wanted, uh, David to be the crab, you know, we do this anyway. But he's sitting next to me as David. And all he was was under the couch with his hand up this crab's butt. We were doing the same thing we always did. So it was hilarious. It worked out really well. Um, Thank you, man. I appreciate that. And, uh, of course, people are going to kick me if I don't ask about Dallas coming out. Okay. Um, it's, that's very exciting news. Yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled. Last night, uh, we had a screening of the pilot. The first time any of us had seen the pilot that we just filmed. Uh, all we had seen is the big promo that they ran on TNT, uh, the teaser, which I thought was wonderful, made my skin crawl, I was so happy, but the pilot is spectacular, and, uh, you know, we go back to work in Texas in October shooting the series, and I'm hoping that sucker runs 13 years like the original, it's great, it's Larry and Linda and myself, and a whole new group of of brilliant young actors, Um, and we're just going to pick up Dallas 20 years later, and continue to do what we did before. Excellent. I can't wait, and I can't wait to see more of the crab, and of course, more Man from Atlantis. Finally, getting to see it uh, remastered. George over there at Warner Archives is such a fan of the whole industry of filmmaking that, uh, trust me, this is going to be a keeper for you. No doubt. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know I have limited time here, um, so just wanted to thank you for talking to me. This has been a huge honor. Well, my pleasure. Thank you for taking the time and and saying the things you said. I appreciate it very much. I'd really like to thank Mr. Duffy for taking the time to sit down with me and answer my questions. We'll talk more about the release of The Man from Atlantis on DVD a little later. But make sure you check out Dallas, which is coming on. I'm sure I don't need to remind people who would listen to this show to do that. And if you have a second, go onto YouTube and check out Patrick Duffy and the Crab. Get familiar with the first part, and I tell you, you'll look forward to the second part. It's really well done. I'm surprised it hasn't made it onto some sort of TV channel yet. Five, four, three, two, one. Greetings, retro fans. This is Metagirl bringing you the top five episodes of the television series The Man from Atlantis. At number five is season one, episode three, Hawk of Mew. Mark, investigating a power outage, discovers a centuries-old hawk statue from the legendary civilization of Mew. The statue has powers, and when Schubert discovers the power of the hawk statue, Mark must prevent him from taking it. Number four is Season 1, Episode 7, Crystal Water, Sudden Death. Schubert attempts to make a satellite weapon to knock out the Earth's communications. However, to power the weapon, he needs the energy crystals protected by a force field under the ocean. The crystals actually power the force field that protects an underwater city, of course. At number three is Season 1, Episode 13, Deadly Carnival. Mark goes undercover to investigate members of a carnival planning to break into a museum. Of course, the only way to break into the museum is through an underwater tunnel, which only Mark can swim. When he is approached to help, he refuses. The owner of the carnival is then kidnapped and threatened unless Mark saves the day. At number two is Season 1, Episode 9, C.W. Hyde. C.W. develops a Jekyll and Hyde personality after swallowing a mysterious liquid. And the number one episode of The Man from Atlantis is... Season 1, Episode 1, Meltdown. Schubert threatens to cause worldwide flooding by using powerful microwaves to melt the Earth's polar ice caps unless the government turns Mark Harris over to him. And there you have it, the Retroist's top five episodes of the television series The Man from Atlantis. Until next time, List fans, this has been Metagirl. So the movies had done very well for The Man from Atlantis, but sadly, the TV show didn't do great. It had its fans, my family loved it, but it wasn't bringing in the people to justify its budget. Also, the critics were not kind. They said the plots were weak, 
that it was more kid stuff that should be on on Saturday morning television. And so after only one short season, The Man from Atlantis went away. But it would get another life. The Man from Atlantis, as I talked with Mr. Duffy about, was one of the first shows to be shown in the People's Republic of China. If anyone lived in China during this point and has heard that, I would love to hear from them what they thought of the show. I did some further reading about it, and it seemed that the decision to broadcast it was largely because of science research beginning to get attention in China after a change in who was leading the government. The show would also go on the air in Brazil, in Portugal, in Kuwait, in the Netherlands, and in the UK. It would actually run on early Saturday evenings opposite the BBC's long-running hit sci-fi series Doctor Who, which at that point was in its 15th season. Now, although the show didn't do well for audiences in the US, in the UK, the series would actually beat Doctor Who during that initial airing. How dare people not watch Doctor Who? There was, of course, attempts to do tie-ins with The Man from Atlantis. They were hoping this would be a big show. Maybe somebody was thinking they're Star Wars. So in 1977, Dell Publishing published novelizations of The Man from Atlantis, written by Richard Woodley. The title was aptly The Man from Atlantis No. 1. This was followed by The Man from Atlantis No. 2, colon, Death Scouts, which was also by Woodley. For the third and fourth, they would drop the numbering system, and the third one was called The Killer Spores, and the fourth, The Ark of Doom. If you're a comic fan, you might be aware of this, because in 1978, Marvel Comics published seven issues of A Man from Atlantis comic book. It was written by Bill Mantlo, with art by Frank Robbins and Frank Springer. If you're not familiar with Marvel Comics, they also have a character called the Submariner. And I remember picking up some issues of The Man from Atlantis comic, and... Also, having read Submariner and having watched the show, finding it all very confusing as a young kid. And I don't know why that is, but the style, the look, I kept thinking, is the Submariner the man from Atlantis? Let's just cut to the chase. I wasn't a very bright kid. Now, I'd read that Patrick Duffy also is working on a man from Atlantis book series that has not been published yet. Maybe interest in the show, rising from the re-release, maybe we'll get to see those put out. Be great. Even as an e-book, it would be pretty wonderful to see them. Now, had the show been successful, Kenner had begun development on a Man from Atlantis action figure and vehicle line in 77. Sadly, it never went past the prototype stage. Those toys, while never making it past the prototype stage, were well documented. And a lot of that documentation has made it onto the web. So if you want to see photos and sketches of some of these great pieces, I suggest you just go on the web and type in Man from Atlantis toy prototypes, and you'll find lots of great cool things. My favorite is the $6 million man. Obviously, Steve Austin sort of just turned into a Mark Harris figure. In 2009, the Warner Archive released the first pilot telefilm of the man from Atlantis, and reception was good. So on July 26th, 2011, Warner Brothers decided to release the man from Atlantis, the complete TV movie collections, which will have all four telefilms, as well as the man from Atlantis, the complete television series on DVD, exclusively through the Warner Archive collection. They pick some really good negatives to work from, and these things look great. Beggars, of course, can't be choosers, and if you've seen the show before, it's probably on bootleg tapes, and this is the first time you're going to get to see a real clean digital copy, and you will not be disappointed. If you're a fan of The Man from Atlantis, head over to the Warner Archive and pick yourself up a copy. The Man from Atlantis is one of those shows that if just given a little bit more time, I believe could have captured more attention. Now, I'm not saying it could have made it for five or six seasons, and it's probably good for Patrick Duffy that it didn't because he landed on Dallas, which was a show that was a lot less physically demanding and had probably more of a future. But I can't help but think that if it had run a couple more seasons and developed more of a mythology, that we would see a lot more from The Man from Atlantis. We would see it on channels like Sci-Fi. Maybe there would even be Man from Atlantis conventions. Who knows? This show was solid 1970s science fiction, and it was fun. It was a lot of fun to watch. And I can tell you this, if you were a kid sitting at home on the couch with your family, it was downright magical.
great Bill Mantlo. Bill Mantlo. Man, what a cool name Mantlo is. This has been a Retro's production. Goodbye.